Uh, the next speaker is Vipav Sharma, who also works for Microsoft, and he works on one of the projects that Dave touched on briefly, and he will give us a more detailed view um, into Azure IoT and how difficult it is to scale um, the backend, the data center side of a world with a billion devices, and how TLC and TLA Plus um, can help with it. So it's all yours. So some of the questions that came out in this presentation probably I will cover in mine. Uh, it will be very basic, uh, like if you're starting with TLA plus, even then it should uh, make sense for you. So I've tried to cover simple examples. So yeah, I work for IoT and I want to talk about how we use TLA plus to build cloud services that can operate at IoT scale. Let's first look at what is IoT. There are billions of devices that connect to cloud today. Uh, these devices could be smart bulbs, smart plugs, modern cars, security monitoring systems, oil rigs. After connecting to cloud, they send massive amount of data. The data is enriched, transformed, and then it is processed by AI models, rule engines, and other services. The processing of data results in action that goes back to the device. Let me take a very simple example to explain how IoT works. Let's say a security camera captures an image and sends it to the cloud. Enrichment adds the location detail for that image. AI model identifies all objects in the image. Let's say a rule engine detects a foreign object as intruder and decides to warn the intruder. The signal to issue the warning goes to the appropriate device through the same channel. As I said, billions of devices connect to cloud today, and projections show exponential growth. So as the scale increases, at some point, previously rare race conditions and rare sequences of failures start becoming more and more common. And you cannot test a service in production for every possible race condition and every combination of uh, failures. We do fault injection, we do stress testing but it does not give an exhaustive coverage. And we use TLA plus to patch that gap in the design phase. And I think there was a question, where do we use TLA plus in product lifecycle? So this is where we use. So every project starts with understanding of requirements. Once we have clear requirements, the next step is to estimate the project. For that, we do this abstract design exercise. We <coughs> identify what components we need to build new, what components we need to modify, and how the, those components will interact at a high level. This is where we do TLA plus model checking, and we iterate over the design until we have a design that passes the model checking. And there are instances where we were making completely wrong assumption about the solution, and when we did the model checking, we realized the project is completely different. Either it aligns differently in the roadmap, or uh, we have to fund it in a, a different way than we were planning. So it allows us to have a clarity on our roadmap. For example, projects we are planning to do next semester, starting Jan, we would be model checking now, and then we will be doing the estimate and planning for those. There was another question, uh, does whole team needs to know TLA plus in order to model check every design? So at Azure IoT, nearly one out of five engineer uh, knowing TLA plus uh, in depth, and others being able to read and review the model. Works out fairly well. Uh, with that, team is able to model check every design. And for a project taking uh, three to four months, if you are proficient in TLA+, plus, I have uh, checked for myself when I'm writing model a few times, it does not take more than a day to write the model and then running and iterating it does not take more than three, four days. So uh, that's a very fair investment for a project of that size and it uh, avoids post-production issues it avoids late design changes, which are far more expensive. We started using TLA plus when we already had our first version of uh, system in production. So for subsequent changes, we did not start with modeling everything we had in production. Uh, rather, we focus on things we are changing. So it tends to happen like sometime when we are modifying an aspect, we realize a bug in the existing system that we had designed previously. At IoT, our scope of uh, verification is right now algorithm and cross-component interactions. Uh, most of the algorithms have problems in uh, like their distributed nature. Instead of code running on a single machine in a single-threaded way, that 
part we can test with uh, traditional testing. Uh, so if, if you think in terms of code and services, we are uh, verifying all states, state machines, and async calls. Async calls are called over the network, called to the file system, called to another process or thread, uh, async locks. So uh, there are several projects where we have used GLA plus so far. There, these are some of the example I could uh, share. We use GLA plus for cross region failover of IoT hub that uh, there we use to verify the data consistency and our RPO and RTO guarantees. RPO, RTOs are basically recovery point objective and recovery time objective, how much downtime is allowed and how much data loss is allowed when cross region failovers happen. Uh, another example is on our message routing system. That is the system which does enrichment and transformation when data arrives. Uh, this existed there before. For many incremental feature to that, we have used TLA+. Plus. Recently, we had to build uh, this uh, distributed uh, cache, a kind of accelerator on top of the storage we were using to uh, serve the volume of requests we were getting. On that, we used TLA plus, we were building it ground up, so we used TLA plus for every aspect, uh, replication, durability, consistency. So let's, now let's talk about a concrete project, a real example, where we use TLA plus, and let's iterate over the design and see what TLA, catches, TLA plus catches and uh, how do we resolve it and how do we find the better design. The problem statement is fairly simple here. So when device connects to cloud, the device is online. When it dis disconnects from cloud, it is offline. And customers want to know when their device is online or offline. So we wanted to send them notifications on these events through a notification system. Notifications could arrive out of order. So we wanted to put a sequence number there so that they can identify the real order in which events happen. And dedupe was handled by underlying system, so we were allowed to send duplicates. It's a very, very simple problem, and a straightforward solution will be a two-phase solution. You write to dedupe, send the notification, update the event, and you have guaranteed every event will go out. You can also enforce serialization there. When you put a scale in the perspective, it becomes a completely different problem. Millions of devices can connect and disconnect at the same time. Thousands of servers can fail at the same time. And during these events, we cannot overwhelm the database or the notification system. We cannot put database and notification system in critical path of device connect. We can't do, uh, reduce the availability of device connect because DB is not responding or it's failing over or something like that. So essentially, nothing can happen synchronously. We need to do a rate control write to database. Let's say we want to cap this feature for 100,000 writes per second on DB and 100,000 writes for notification systems. We need to cap there while devices could be in billions and millions can move at a time. So we need to absorb that at service level in by maintaining in-memory states. There it becomes a much harder problem. So I will start with a rudimentary approach that uh, we started with. Uh, so when I talk about this approach, many times people say, oh, there is a problem because there is a no atomicity between two updates we are doing. So pay close attention to that. See if that is the problem or there is some other problem. So it's straightforward when device connects, the <coughs> primary sends a notification with the sequence number one. And in the background, it updates the DB with the last sent notification. Let's look at the primary again. So device disconnected. And uh, eventually, at some point in a rate control way, notification went out. and database was updated later on in a rate control way with the notification that went out. So let's see where this, uh, if this can fail uh, in certain cases. So if primary goes down, a uh, standby takes over the role of that particular server. It knows the device state. It knows what is the last notification we have sent out. It can resume the operation from here. OK, so failure can happen in the middle of sending notification. Let's see if there is a problem with that. If device disconnected, and before the notification could go out, the server failed. At this point, the new primary looks at the DB and said, oh, we haven't, uh, we haven't sent notification for this disconnect event. It sends out the pending notification. So if the server fails before sending notification, it is fine. We have already seen after sending and persisting in DB, it's fine. Let's also try out the option where it fails right after sending the notification. So here the device disconnected. 
and first it sent out the notification and before uh, it could write to database it failed the new primary took over now it finds that uh, the last set notification is for the connect event although the client has already got the disconnect event but dedupe is done by underlying system so we can send the duplicate notification and this is a valid state for the system so there is no problem if primary fails in between sending notification but there is one particular sequence exactly one way which in which this can fail and that requires two failure a failure from the service and a failure from the device so the device disconnected and we sent out the notification for that event everything looks fine so far and now the failure sequence starts so the device connected and before primary could write to the db the primary failed causing device to disconnect and device did not come back and connect so in this scenario uh, the uh, the primary uh, thinks that the last notification was for the disconnect event uh, the device is in disconnected state and it would not send the notification the client will be thinking the device is online because the last notification client has got is for the connect event so this is a fairly simple example uh, i want to walk through now how we and this is a real example this is actually something we tried out and in early phase itself we started uh, writing the tla model at this point and let's see what we caught so uh, we have four components we have the device we have the service we have the database and the client uh, in tla plus we need to model states so there are four states corresponding to those things uh, device has two states connected or disconnected there is a in memory state which is either uh, notification is pending or not pending database state which is the last sent notification and its uh, sequence number <coughs> and the client having a uh, client has all the notifications that client has received this is what that some part of our tla model looks like this is where i am declaring all the states and there is a type check there is no uh, type system but there is type invariant that catches uh, uh, you know type issues in uh, tla plus so the that is essentially saying the device connect, uh, the connection state is a boolean which can be connect or disconnect persisted state is the notification that we sent out in its sequence number device in memory state is uh, whether the notification is pending or not and then notified state i also want to highlight here that there are more comments than actual code so this is our design doc when developer will writing will go and write the code the de developer will read this not a 10 page uh, some word doc or pdf somewhere cool so uh, we take this uh, state i wouldn't go in the detail of algorithm probably i would be able to share it later on through the github repo we have uh, let's look at invariant we run this algorithm with again when we start writing invariant we don't think of what code we have to write we think of what we need to verify and here it's a very simple verification either the client should know the device state or we should be planning to send the device state and then we have to translate that logic to code so here it is essentially saying either the notified state is same as the device state or in memory state is that service is planning to send out the notification we will try different algorithm the coding of invariant will change but the logic wouldn't it will stay the same thing either the notification should have gone out or we should be planning to send it okay so this particular algorithm we ran in to toolbox we got this error trace on uh, left corner let's look at what what it's telling us this is the exact sequence of failure that i showed through animation so the initial part like reading it top down the first part of it says uh, uh, first part of it says the system started and then the device connected we sent out the notification before we could persist it the device failed and uh, device disconnected and service partition mode that is basically the service failure leading to a state where the invariant is violated so on top it's saying uh, invariant uh, notification state condition is violated cool so we found the issue how do we resolve that again uh, one fix would be we start doing excessive amount of bookkeeping in the database but that is not allowed 
we wouldn't scale if we do that. So we take an alternative approach. We do a set of optimizations and take an alternative design. We generate in-memory sequence numbers. The service assigns monotonically increasing sequence number to each event that happens. So if there are millions of devices connecting and disconnecting, it is assigning them sequence number. Then it is flushing to uh, those events to DB in the same order, order of their sequence number at a rate control manner. If we don't want to exceed about say 100k IOPS, we are not exceeding that. At that rate, we write to the DB. Uh, then there is another background thread which is constantly reading from the database and uh, sending notifications to the notification system, again at a rate controlled manner, and it checkpoints once in a while to keep track of amount of work it has done. So it's fairly simple algorithm, but uh, here it might sound a bit complex. I will show it with animation how it works. I wouldn't go in the detail of how we generate the sequence number. It's a, a standard algorithm. For those who are interested, it's high-low algorithm, which, which is pretty standard for generating monotonically increasing sequence numbers. So let's see how this, uh, this solution uh, works for a simple scenario. So device connected. At some point, the event made its way to DB. At some point later, a background thread picked that event and sent it to the client. The background thread came back a few minutes later and checkpointed. Here, one thing to notice is the event, the first write to the DB is per device. Like if millions of devices connect, it will be written million times in a rate control manner. The second checkpoint is not per device. It's not we are doubling our IO utilization. That checkpoint is once uh, after a certain time, let's say every minute or every two minutes or every 10 seconds, two seconds, whatever granularity we want to checkpoint it. Now, here the interesting part is if the system fails at any point, the DB has sufficient information to identify what has gone out and what has not gone out. Uh, let's look at the uh, other scenarios like in case of disconnect, how it works. It's pretty similar. So uh, the notification goes out and then the uh, system checkpoints. If the failure happens at this point, the new primary knows the highest event is disconnect and uh, database has the uh, checkpoint for that, so it doesn't need to resend anything. If the checkpoint is slightly behind, we are allowed to resend some notifications, so that is fine. Now let's look at the scenario where uh, where we found failure in the previous approach. It shouldn't fail here because we have sufficient information in the database to handle that scenario. So the primary uh, put this event in the DB, and before it could send it out, it failed. The new primary took over, and it knows that that notification has not gone out, so it sends that to the underlying system. Here, one more thing this primary can do is, during failover, because a lot of devices are moving, it can absorb the transient jitter and uh, then flush the final state of the device. Mostly, the downstream systems are interested to know where, whether the device is online or offline. They don't want excessive amount of notification. So for example, if a device is connecting, disconnecting 1,000 times in a minute, sending 1,000 notification is not what the underlying system is expecting in this case. So, now the now we modify the TLA plus model. So we actually started with the first model that I talked about, and this is the same model uh, updated to, to the next version. So uh, states look very similar. There are a couple of extra variables. In memory state uh, has a, a tracking of two different writes, and uh, persisted state has a mode tracking <laughs> again for persisting it in a D, uh, DB and then when it's sent out for the checkpointing purpose. Now we also have more invariant. The first invariant is about the sequence number. Sequence number should not go back when a failover happens on service or a cross region failover happens. Any kind of failover should always make sequence number go forward. Uh, the second one is the more interesting one. This is the one that we, uh, we were uh, uh, looking at in previous solution. So here it's all it talks all about persisted state. So here it says either the notification should have gone out or the, uh, the DB should be thinking that the uh, notification has to go out. And DB state is durable, it is consistent. So we know that that will not change in middle of uh, uh, failover. So when we run this algorithm with 
TLA plus toolbox, we get a clear run with some starts on the top. And in this, we were able to iterate over design. It does not take, uh, if I remember, more than a week or week and a half. We were able to come up with a solution which actually scales for our need. And uh, we were able to find a solution where we don't put the database and notification system first in the critical path of connect. We don't want to lower the availability of our connect because we have to send out a notification. We did not put database in a also uh, in the path, synchronous path, so we are writing in a rate control way, so there is no IoT scenario which will cause either database to get overwhelmed or the notification system to get huge spike in notifications because something happened in the IoT space. And in this instance, there was no design change. We took that uh, uh, design, we implemented it, it went to production, there was no design change after that. It worked perfectly at once. Uh, and it has been the trend for all other projects I talked about. So wherever we have used TLA plus, uh, we have eliminated late design changes. Otherwise, we were we used to identify at least some major change during a later stage of testing, like a stress testing, and uh, you know even sometime during review, someone will catch a design issue. And that kind of rework requires huge reinvestment on the project. While iterating over a 50 line of TLA plus requires a week or two weeks. Here you're talking about a code that has already, you know, we have test coverage and all, and we are reworking. It takes more time. It saves a lot more, first by avoiding those reworks, and also by allowing us to do aggressive optimizations. In many cases, in IoT, we cannot build the solution unless we do those optimizations. And it makes uh, cross-component integration easy because we have very clear spec of each component. So if five engineers are working on a project or if multiple teams or orgs are working on a project, you share the spec and then you can code against it. Very unlikely during integration something will fail. It can fail because of naming or some uh, light issues, but it will not fail because the design coming together is not right. Code reviews also become very easy with this. So uh, for this particular de uh, de uh, implementation, I did the code review. And uh, I was, uh, first I looked at the TLA plus model, compared it with the code. In 10, 15 minutes, I know this is what it is implementing. And then my primary focus is about uh, code quality, code structure, test coverage, uh, conventions, not about thinking about, OK, when this code will integrate with five other components elsewhere, how it's going to function. That is more captured in the TLA plus model. Yeah, so uh, this is what I wanted to share. I have a couple from my team here. A couple would you join for questions? Thanks, yeah. Vaiva. <clears throat> so, questions? Hi. So, when you're working with uh, systems of this scale, what size are the, like the constants in your models typically? And how many times did you find an issue where you started with a small model and everything passed, and then you let it run on a much larger model, and then did find an issue? So it's more with, a, so initially when I used to write TLA plus model, I used to tend to model everything. Gradually I learned how to write the right abstraction on top of the design. So actually constant size and number of variables to play with has reduced as my understanding of TLA plus increased. It has less to do with uh, what I'm trying to model check. You segued perfectly. Um, so you mentioned the not modeling everything a couple of times. I'm curious what techniques or, or hints you have about isolating other systems that you're not interested in modeling right now, but making sure that that isolation is correct for the model that you are working on. So th that is an optimization. That's because we are, if we are investing on a project for, let's say, three months, and we have this 20 system modeling will take a month or more, we don't have time to do that, and we don't have that investment there. How we model that is we treat systems we are not changing as a, as a spec. We say this is the guarantee that system has that, yeah, that is just a review. Like the team has to review that that spec is correct. Now that system, because it's not model verified, it could have flaw in that. But as long as it does the, uh, what the spec is saying, rest of the changes will work properly. How often do you use a like specialization where one spec is implementing another spec? 
or are they usually uh, just isolated? No. Uh, yeah, they are mostly isolated. Yeah, that's one thing where, uh, I mean, there are changes we have made to the same system and we have done quite a bit of copy paste. We, we have to start structuring TLA plus uh, better in our code. Are you generally using just the TLA toolbox, or are there other tools that you've been using, like, like some of the command line options or any, anything uh, else? I have been using just the toolbox. Um, I, I once used the, the command line, I think, to generate the, um, th there's a flow graph, which, like a state, ex like a state graph, so I was working on a spec, which, um, but I was actually, not able to like really the stack trace was just too long and I wanted to like look at the 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 state like the state graph uh, so I used that the command line option once um, and uh, once I had hit into like a state explosion and that's another place where I was like trying to <coughs> for debugging purposes I ended up using the the command line option. Yeah, maybe if I may add to this, um, the toolbox tries to make the. 80% that you do with TLA plus really easy, and then for the remaining 20%, the idea is that it makes it possible to get to the data, like a state graph that's generated, it's generated in dot format, so you can, can import it into a much more powerful viewer that can handle maybe a thousand states, where the toolbox can only handle 100 states or so, um, if it's generated to PDF. And also, <clears throat> if you have larger models, what I see, what people do is um, if they have a larger model that takes a little longer than maybe a day or so or a few hours, then they might put it on, on a remote, mo um, remote machine on a command line sitting somewhere in the data center running out of the command line. Um, yeah. More questions? Maybe from over there? This covered here? <laughs> Hi, so uh, how collaborative is the process of creating a specification? So is it one person creating a spec and somebody else reviewing it, or is it more of a team effort towards getting to a finished spec? So is it something that you iterate on uh, and so on? It's, it's a combination, but uh, for most of uh, a smaller project size, three to four month kind of project, it's one individual taking it and uh, writing the whole spec. Uh, there is one example I took earlier, which was about uh, accelerator on top of our backend storage. There it was all uh, team effort, so different individuals writing uh, different part of spec. Some specs a uh, couple has written, uh, some I have written, and some others. So I think like uh, in this, the project that uh, Webhub is talking about, like he wrote like one initial spec and then we like uh, when we had a high level um, confidence on the on the approach then we drilled down into more detailed specs and then like different people like i took on like some specs and and he also took on some specs um this the example that like uh, the the device connection exam um, project example that he took that was like done by a different team member completely and that was like the first time that guy had use TLA plus so um, like we encourage like all members of the team to like learn TLA plus but like yeah it's not a requirement but yes like like we reviewed we both reviewed that particular TLA model at Web of Reviews my TLA model and I review his so um, it's part of the process no. more questions As you've created specs, have you come across any like conceptual library? Like this is a very common way of representing a database. This is a very common way of representing a network. That that sort of if it's not the spec itself, it's the idea behind it. Yeah. Uh, we haven't come up, uh, seen any like in uh, public domain. We have created our own, and uh, there's certain structure we follow. So there are a specific set of dependencies that our system has. We have uh, Cosmos DB, we have I mean, network, and we have a certain caching component and all. And we have modeled pretty much all of them once somewhere. Mm. We tend to reuse the same design, but uh, that, that is something I, I was talking to Mark is that we need to probably put in GitHub and uh, make it available. Yeah. 
So you do have some kind of internal repository of sorts where you say, look, we've, we've really figured out Cosmos DB pretty well. You should probably look to this as your reference model. Um, yeah. The previous speaker mentioned that it's beneficial to keep the specs written by the authors of the system as well. I don't know how architects, uh, what the handoff inside Microsoft looks like between an architect designing something um, to then <coughs> the engineers who might do the implementation, but d does TLA plus used it all in that kind of conversation? Or is it written by the engineers as well? Uh, it, it depends. Uh, I mean, uh, in some project uh, like uh, the uh, cash example I was talking about, the accelerator example. Their engineers uh, were writing TLA plus model. Uh, there are cases where we have uh, projects planned for next semester, and I'm writing the TLA plus model right now, but the engineer who would work on it wouldn't write uh, the model. I will just hand it over. So you have an understanding of it? Yeah. <clears throat> Maybe going back to your first question with regards to the repository. Um, so with Cosmos in particular, the Cosmos team itself put out user-focused specifications of Cosmos. So you have with Co Cosmos five different consistency guarantees, and all those are specified as in Pascal and are part of the official Cosmos documentation. If you go on, uh, uh, I think it's on YouTube, there's a talk by... Um, a visiting professor, especially about this kind of documentation and how it works to do user facing documentations with TLA. Um, then, relating to, related to the question, something like a repository with ideas. Um, what I'm currently trying to get started is um, a so-called, what I call a community modules um, repository so that not necessarily share something like a different specification of a database, but more fundamental stuff that is uh, at the level of the building operators that we already have. Um, I guess most of you have specified the image function uh, or an operator to get the image from a function that's supposed to go into the community modules, or maybe a um, specification of what a graph does or some operation of, on a graph. Um, and that's on GitHub now. It's um, pretty small right now. But every, I like to invite everybody to contribute their specifications to this community module. And the bar is definitely lower than contributing something into the standard modules. The standard modules are pretty much proven correct, and these community modules are not. It's a community effort. Everybody's invited. And let's try to grow it. And what proves useful will get more scrutiny. More questions? OK, we came in five minutes early. So now it's time for the first coffee break. Uh, gives us 30 minutes. Uh, let's uh, continue at 10.55. 10.55, and there's coffee and beverages outside. And thanks, Wipeup and Kapil.